Nelson from New York City watching solo. Mary in Evanston with two others. Frida in the in New York. Madison, Wisconsin in the house. Thanks, guys. Humboldt Park in Chicago. We got another Wisconsin. Wonderful. We got a family of four in Hanover Park. Thanks, you guys. Catherine and Christy. This is wonderful. We've got Ithaca, New York. Thanks, Paula. Austin, Texas. Thanks for being here. Corvallis, Oregon. Thanks, Paul. Terrific. Rebecca and Preston, too, in Michigan. Hyde Park in Chicago. Pat in Pittsburgh. Another Rochester, New York. Thanks, guys. Terrific. We'll let that keep going. Please continue to check in. We want to capture everybody's voices and see you fill this room. For now, though, I'd like to get us started. We have a packed evening and, um, and a great uh, program planned for you all. So I'm Anna Garcia Doyle, the executive director of the One Earth Film Festival. I want to welcome you to our virtual screening and discussion, which we hope will present rich opportunities for learning and provide a brave and safe space for important conversations that matter deeply right now in our country and across the globe. One Earth's 10th season theme is inspiring change. I was inspired by a remark from Fantastic Fungi showing how much we can learn from nature. Nature is a community and communities survive better than individuals. Communities rely upon cooperation and that is the power of goodness. I do not wanna go any farther without thanking our wonderful sponsors and partners without whom we could not do this work. So thank you to Dig Right In Landscaping, Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, Triton College, Tom Bassett Dilly Architects, and Swati Saxena Baird and Warner. Two other quick notes. At the end of this event, please share your experiences on the survey linked to at the top of your video window so One Earth can keep improving what we do. And if your circumstances allow, please donate to support One Earth's nonprofit year round screening events, youth programs, and more at OneEarthFilmFest.org. We are thrilled you're with us as One Earth Film Fest celebrates 10 years of inspiring change and utilizes the power of film to spark change on topics of environment and those intersected with environment, like social justice. The fest has had to adapt to a virtual format, but we strive to stay true to our model. While we're not physically together, we are here together, live, virtually, still able to create community, become aware of issues, engage in dialogue, and be inspired to act. African-American activist Angela Davis said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. The stories in our fest films reflect that possibility. Our collective actions will achieve that possibility. Our event will take place in four parts. We'll introduce you to some folks who'll help us have a great discussion after the film. We'll then watch it together. Then afterwards, we'll unpack the film's themes in a facilitated Q&A with our wonderful panelists. Please participate by using the chat to share thoughts, ideas, or questions. We'll end by sharing concrete actions you can take to be part of the solution. These actions come from our panelists and other action partners. As we lift current movements and reframe narratives around justice, environment, and bringing innovative, equitable solutions to our climate crisis, we're hopeful for the future. I am grateful to the knowledgeable filmmakers, film subjects, facilitators, and panelists joining this and other fest events. They'll guide discussions to help spark and sustain actions for the protection of our one earth and for the just treatment of its resources and its people. We found that shared agreements help keep our conversations safe and respectful. Please observe these agreements when participating. Put aside your preconceptions, acknowledge your privilege, internalize what you've learned, approach the conversation with respect, engage your active listening, use I statements and get comfortable with your own story, acknowledge native peoples who came before us in protecting our land. One last thing before we meet our facilitator and program participants. If you're active on social media, Tell people this is happening. Amplify these voices and be part of the community we're building here together. The hashtag for the festival is hashtag OEFF2021. Thanks again to all of you for being here. And now I'd like to turn it over to our facilitator to introduce themselves, the panelists, and our film. Greetings and welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie McCray. I am a resident here in Oak Park, Illinois. I am also an executive coach, consultant, and facilitator 
I work for myself. My business is Executive Material, and I am really excited to be facilitating tonight's film. This is one that I've been looking forward to for a long time, as I'm sure many of you have been as well. I want to take a moment and talk about how we roll with the One Earth Film Festival. You know how when you um, go to a movie and you're really excited about what you've just seen and you want to talk to someone, sometimes it can be hours, sometimes days before you get to compare notes with someone else who has also seen the film. Well, that's not going to happen tonight because we are going to invite you to hang around with us immediately after the film to share your highlights and the things that stood out to you with the rest of us that are part of the screening tonight. Another teaser for you to hang around with us is that we have a couple of panelists that I am sure you are going to want to hang around in order to meet and to hear from as they are experts in the area of the fungi kingdom. I'm going to introduce you to them very briefly now so that you can put a name with a face, but then I'll tell you more about them after the film. So first off, we have Dr. Gregory Mueller, who is from the Chicago Botanic Garden. Welcome, Dr. Mueller. And we also have Mr. Mike Strode from the Cola Nut Collaborative. Welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> All right, so now what I want to do is introduce you to tonight's film. As you know, the title of our film tonight is The Fantastic Fungi. This is a film that is guaranteed to shift your consciousness. It's going to take us on an immersive journey into the magical infrastructure that exists under the ground right beneath our feet. This magical infrastructure is called the Mycelium Network. You will get to hear from renowned scientists such as Paul Stamets, as well as best-selling authors like Andrew Weil and Michael Pollan. They are going to explain how this mycelium network, which is part of the fungi kingdom, has the capacity to not just provide us with wonderful mushrooms for food, but also has the capacity to recycle organic material, to heal, and to save our planet. By the end of the film, we are convinced that you will be impressed not only with the intelligence of the fungi kingdom, but that you will also be impressed with the beauty and the hope that the fungi kingdom offers us in response to some of the most pressing problems that are facing us today. So sit back, enjoy the film, hang out with us afterwards, and we will regroup and join the panelists and you for our post-film discussion. Okay, yeah, anyone else? Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna pronounce this name correctly, so my apologies if I don't. Uhuru is saying the micro, to the micro universe, here we come. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other comments about what you saw or heard? Okay, so then what I'm going to do is move on now and um, I want to bring our panelists back and tell you a little bit more about them so that we can bring them into the discussion. So first off, um, Dr. Gregory Mueller, again, he is the chief scientist and the Nagami vice president of science at the Chicago Botanic Garden. 
Dr. Mueller's research and training programs focus on the diversity, ecology, and conservation of mushrooms and their relatives. That sounds interesting. He has authored 16 books and more than 100 journals. He is also past president of the Mycological Society of America and leads international fungal conservation uh, programs for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. He is also a lecturer at the University of Chicago and an ad adjunct professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago and Northwestern University. Welcome again, Dr. Mueller. And we also have Mike Strode. Mike is the founding coordinator of the Cola Nut Collaborative. Mike is a writer, an urban, uh, urban cyclist, facilitator, and a solidarity economy organizer. Um, Mike also runs the Cola Nut Collaborative, which is the only time bank that exists in the city of Chicago. So if you're like me, you're probably wondering, what exactly is a time bank? Well, I have learned as, being, uh, as a result of this uh, participating in this film that a time bank is like an economic mycelium network. It allows you to trade time for other skills and services that you might be in need of instead of using currency. And Mike is going to tell us a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So I have a question that I would like to put. Yes, thank you. Welcome, Mike. I have a question that I would like to put to each of you and ask you to share your expertise with us. And while I'm doing that, I want to invite our uh, participants to put their questions in the chat. And we have people that are monitoring the chat. And so um, once we get past hearing um, from Dr. Mueller and Mike, we're gonna put some of your questions to them so that they can provide their input. So I'm gonna start with, um, with Dr. Mueller. You have said that one of the things you want to talk about is the underground networks and the incredible ways that trees communicate. So can you tell us a little bit more about it? It was touched, in, uh, touched upon in the film, but what more can you share with us about that? Sure, Stephanie. And yeah, great film. Um, as it was you know, talked about, we have this, the common mycelial network that permeates through the soil. So, you know, our traditional way of thinking is, uh, Trees are separate beings, each one separated, but really no tree is an island, right? They're all connected by these mycelial threads. So these fungi are playing critical roles for these trees by bringing in water, other nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, micronutrients, things like that, into the tree. In return, they take excess sugars <clears throat> that the tree makes through photosynthesis. And then they connect one tree to another tree. And so from larger trees to smaller trees, there can be movement of carbon, there can be movement of nitrogen. We also now know that there can be uh, connections of defense mechanisms. So if this tree is being attacked by insects, it produces chemicals to protect that tree. And those chemicals can actually be signaled and go to trees that haven't been attacked yet, and they build up their defense mechanisms before they're attacked. So there's communication between these trees. So yeah, we can talk more about that, but that's, that's the, the gist of the, of the relationship. Okay, great. Thank you for providing us a high level overview. And I am pretty sure people are going to want to hear more. So we will come back. And Mike, um, I understand that you're not a scientist per se, but you do specialize in what you call human mycelial networks. Can you uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about this and how those networks relate to different type of networks and then how all of that relates to us as individuals? 
Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you. Um, so I am one of those amateurs mentioned in the film, you know, someone who uh, has, is very intrigued and very curious about um, human processes and, and human collaboration. And so in terms of thinking about human mycelial networks, I'm really very interested in, in the group processes that build cohesion, that build collaboration, that build connection, and that build community. And so um, the, the work that I do with the Colonet Collaborative Time Bank is really about engaging with communities and finding ways that communities can plug into the, the resources and skills that exist inside of their communities. And much like those mycelial networks underground are sharing resources um, and, and, and nutrients beneath the trees, um, do that same process within communities. And ultimately, you know, um, as we are like trees, you know, make make all individuals, make all residents and, and folks in communities thrive um, in different ways by that sharing of resources. Very good. Okay, so I do have a couple of questions from our participants. So I'm going to um, ask one that we are seeing repeatedly. So, and this might be for either of you, but I'll start with you, Dr. Mueller. Um, do you know whether there have been any explorations into using myce uh, mycelium for the treatment of COVID-19? I don't know. I mean, none of the uh, current vaccines are fungal-based. Um, I assume that people have looked into it, but I don't know anything more than that. But none of the current, vi none of the current vaccines are fungal-based. Okay. All right. Um, and then also there's a question. Um, uh, what determines whether or not a tree is considered a mother tree? Uh, yeah. So there's, there's still questions about, you know, how um, deliberate or how intentional any of the, the movement between trees are, right? So many of you have watched the film Avatar, right? Where you had this one living, breathing uh, planet with everything going on. Or the Gaia hypothesis is another way to look at that. And but the other way to look at this is that we know that nutrients or everything, you know, um, water flows downhill, right? Goes from uh, if you've got a, a big bucket to and it will flow to a smaller area of where water is. If you've got, you know, from um, from a higher uh, uh, a higher uh, elevation to a lower elevation, and so this could just be physical movement from a uh, mother tree being the larger tree that has more nutrients in it, more carbon that is producing because it's got more leaves, so it's photosynthesizing more, and the flow is just going to be to a smaller tree that mm. has less nutrient availability. So. Is it intentional or is it just physics? And there's still debate in the, in the community on how intentional it is and how much it's just physics. So um, right now I'd say a mother tree versus the other tree is really primarily on size. And uh, which tree is healthier? We also know that a, a healthier tree, right, is going to be um, having more carbon it can spare or more nitrogen, more nutrients it can spare and it's being shunted then to surrounding trees that may have less nutrients, may have less carbon. Great, thank you. All right, Mike, this might be a little bit of a curve, but I'm seeing people ask some things about biomimicry. And since you are so adept at um, taking, what, the metaphor or of the mycelium and adapting it to um, human parallels. Can you tell us a little bit about biomimicry and how that relates to us? Uh, certainly, yeah. You know, biomimicry is an area of great fascination for myself, um, and, and certainly it, it relates to that work of time banking. Um, so I would go back to the origin of the time bank. And, and first of all, biomimicry just simply means um, designing, uh, you know, human systems in ways that, that mimic um, biological processes. Um, and so, you know, like that mycelial network, thinking about how that connects to human networks and network weaving. Um, and so, you know, related to the, the launch of the Time Bank, I was actually facilitating the social permaculture um, course inside of a Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living. 
for those unfamiliar with permaculture, it's a, a, a sustainable agriculture method that seeks to mimic natural processes. So seeks to, you know, do agriculture in a way that mimics how things would grow naturally um, in their own, in their, in, you know, indigenous ecosystems. Um, so, you know, um, the, but the time bank was really about, you know, looking at uh, the processes that I was learning in that permaculture course and looking at how we could design, you know, a system that wasn't, you know, working against the, what, what Dr. Mueller talked about, you know, in terms of water going down a hill. You don't want to truck water up a hill if you don't need it up there, right? You want to kind of plant where the, where the water is naturally going to be that the plant requires. And so in, in the same way, you know, um, building these human systems that don't work against, you know, um, our, 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 you know, inclinations, you know, that tries to kind of maybe nudge behaviors into, into uh, places slowly. Wow, I wasn't sure what to expect. That was a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so here is one for perhaps both of you. So what, if anything, can we do as consumers to support these potential therapies um, in becoming legalized and um, especially legalized so that they're used by uh, equitably by all communities, especially BIPOC communities? We can start with you, Dr. Mueller. Um, I think w one of the things is that, um, you know, scientists, right, we start with the research, right? And as we learn more and more of the benefits and the um, why this is important to continue this work and to make it available, I think that's why we're seeing, I forget how many states now, right, are have legalized um, recreational fungi and other uh, uh, hallucinogenic uh, um, um, compounds. And so what we're seeing is that with this increase in knowledge, with the, the information that's coming out of the benefits from this, um, that is allowing people who've known maybe that this has been the, the fact for a while to use those data to impact um uh, their legislators, whatever, to to change the laws to allow these to be legalized. So, yeah, I think it starts with knowledge. And what is the best way, just to follow up on your answer, what's the best way for um, a, a average consumer to keep up with that research? Um, there are, you know, a growing number of, of uh, general stories about this. Of course, there's a lot of uh, data on the web that you can uh, find and, and keep track of. The trick, of course, is being able to differentiate between the um, real data and others. So, you know, one of the stories that just came out, which I found fascinating, just came out this week in, um, in Science Magazine and a couple of other really influential journals, was the bit with microdosing. And so there was a study doing, looking at microdosing of um, psychedelic compounds, whether it's psilocybin or LSD versus placebos, and they found that there was really no difference. And so the, the most recent data that just came out this week is implying that it is microdosing might really be a placebo effect. Um, now, when you have the higher dosages, that's not going to be placebo. But uh, at these microdosing, you know, maybe it's um, not as effective as, as we think. Maybe it is just a placebo effect. So, so the data still keep coming out. Every, you know, very frequently we're getting new information. Okay, great. And Mike, do you have anything to add about what the average consumer can do to help legalize these therapies and um, ensure that they're avail available equitably across all communities? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm definitely happy to take on that question of equity because that is one of those human systems, you know, that we are, are always negotiating. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that I would go to is um, the uh, initial work that I did with the Healthy Food Hub and Black Oak Center around food access and, and food availability in, in South, West, South and West Side neighborhoods um, in Chicago. And so um, the one thing that we always talked about is that availability is not enough. So it's not enough to just say that we're going to legalize and make these things available. You actually have to design a process that does not map on to the existing apartheid structures, food apartheid, medical apartheid. Um, but we actually ha have conversations where we say, 
how are we going to make these things available? How are we going to ensure that people who might actually be using these, you know, um, medicines inside of their cultural practices are not simply, you know, marginalized further because, you know, these things become, you know, harvested by the, the medical complex and, and, you know, become less available. So I would say availability is not enough. We actually have to engage deeply in the policy with how these questions of equity are going to be parsed in the future. Great. That reminds me of how when we legalized marijuana, it was available, it became more available, but it certainly did not um, or has not to date hit the target of helping some of the communities that were most damaged by it. So that might be an example of what you were talking about. Um, Okay, so switching gears just a bit, I have a question about um, uh, going back to the trees and how the trees communicate. Does that same process work with different species, Dr. Mueller? Yes. So there are data to show that it crosses. So it's not just the same species, but the, um, in fact, some of the original studies. So Susan Shamard was one of the, the featured scientists on the, in the show, and she was able to show that um, you could go between, it was a birch and a fir tree, so two very, very different types of trees, but there were nutrient transfer between those things. So yes, they can cross species boundaries. Okay, good. Um, and Mike, um, are you able to tell us, since we know that the mycelium can help with oil spills, does it also help decompose plastics? Do you know? Uh, that. I would actually pitch to to Dr. Mueller, but you know, I, I certainly can't say that there. You know, I mean, as we've seen in the film, there are wildly a, a wide number of uses. You know, I actually because I, I I do connect with other people in this space who are amateurs, but then who kind of have expanded their practice. I've seen people who, I, in fact, one of my my favorite experiments was someone who was making plates out of you know a variety of different you know mushrooms. Um, so that there's there are lots of applications. So, yeah, I would say you know they were talking about the um, whole radical mycology movement, which are these great, mostly younger people, but I don't think they're all you know super young, but that are looking at all kind of novel ways to use fungi. So the example they used on the film was the cigarette butts. Um, uh, so probably I don't know of any. Um, product that's come onto the market. I know that there's people looking into plastic uh, degradation and uh, that type of thing, but I don't know if any of that's actually come onto the market. Okay. Now, um, based on how pervasive the mycelium is from what we learned in the film, is it also able to survive under buildings, given how much we've, you know, built up heavily populated areas? Depending on how... It, yeah, it depends on how. So, um, land transformation, land change, land use change is the biggest threat that we have to all biodiversity, almost all, maybe not rats and things like that, uh, which are biodiversity, right? But I mean, then native biodiversity. Um, so, it's a real problem. Asphalt, uh, you know, big concrete parking lots, all that does definitely negatively impact, but, but fungi, um, you know, can go pretty far. So depending on how big the expanse of concrete or something, there can be fungi underneath that. We know that um, these mushrooms have incredible um, pressure, power, and there's actually sometimes mushrooms will erupt through asphalt uh, um, sidewalks or parking lots or we have things coming up into people's basements and whatever else. So the mycelium can persist. And as long as they can get their nutrients, right, as long as they can get food and moisture, they're going to, they're going to survive down there and persist. So they're pretty amazing what they'll, uh, uh, how long they'll persist and what they can put up with. Okay. And Mike, um, if someone was interested in becoming an amateur, um, I don't know what you would call it, uh, mushroom gatherer. What suggestions would you have for how they could go about doing that in the Chicago area? Absolutely. 
Um, well, and so, actually, I'm going to broaden. I'm going to broaden that question because we have people from not just Chicago, but let's start with Chicago and maybe just also address it in general. Yes. So uh, starting from the Chicago context and starting from my my fascination with mushrooms, um, as I mentioned, working with Healthy Food Hub and Black Oak Center, um, I was working the register for the course of about 10 years at the market day um, that we hosted um, in South Shore. And, you know, one of uh, our, our favorite customers and, you know, a frequent sort of participant volunteer in the market, uh, Mike Janicek you know, would come in there occasionally and he'd be like, hey, Mike, you know, I was out on the weekend and I found this, you know, chicken of the woods and I had a whole bunch, you know, why don't you take a bag of this, you know, chicken of the woods, a wonderful mushroom that you can cook that has the, you know, a, a type of flavor, you know, similar to chicken, but, you know, certainly, um, so, you know, Mike, Mike, Mike would bring me the chicken of the woods, you know, he would tell me about the morel, you know, hunting. Um, so, so that's, you know, one way, like being in community with other folks who are interested in food, who are interested in agriculture, um, you will brush against people who, who are, you know, interested in mushrooms in your area. Um, you know, and certainly in the Chicago area, we have, you know, um, or in, in the Midwest, rather, we have the morel season that comes up. And so, you know, you can certainly find, you know, morels, you know, um, where you might be in Illinois or in Indiana. Um, so I, I would say, you know, check with your local mycological societies. Um, we will have some of those on the action page, you know, and you can find folks there, um, but also your, your farmer's markets and, you know, other spaces where uh, foodies gather. Okay, good. And Dr. Mueller, anything you'd like yeah. to add with respect to that? Yeah, just to, to okay. add what Mike was saying, that's a great way to do it. Um, you want to be more, um, what do you want to call it, organized in that um, most areas have a, a mushroom club. So in Illinois, in the Chicago area, we have the Illinois Mycological Association, uh, which meets every month and then has uh, forays to go out and collect and learn about these. And we have talks and lectures. And so it's a great way to do that. It's also a great community. Um, if you're from other areas around the, the country, you can go to um, the North American Mycological Association's website, and there's a whole, you can go and click on look for clubs and you can get a whole list. There's hundreds of clubs in the U.S. And then if you really want to even be more engaged, um, I'm part of a group that's called the Fungal Diversity Survey, Fundus, where we're engaging amateur um, citizen scientists into um, documenting data, putting their images up on iNaturalist, which is this wonderful link that you can put images up and the community will help identify those. So it's a, it's a, um, um, a community-based uh, identification tool, but we also then are using those to help uh, document the diversity and distribution of fungi and using those data for making decisions on conservation issues, you know, what fungi are really rare and threatened. And so we're using, so there's a lot of information that uh, citizen scientists, community scientists can provide. So yeah, I hope everybody gets engaged because it can really make a difference. Okay, good. Uh, I know I'm planning to, so you, you both of you may be hearing from me after this. Um, so um, Dr. Mueller, um, are mushrooms found in nature any healthier than um, mushrooms that are grown, um, I don't know, on a farm or? a different environment yeah. outside nature? It's a great question. And pretty much, well, depends on the mushroom, right? So only, some, well, part of it is that only some mushrooms we can grow. You know, there's a bunch of mushrooms that we cannot uh, grow in culture. We can't get the mycelium to grow, or if we can, we can't get them to, to spore, we can't get them to form the, the spore cut. So that's one thing. So some things like our, chanterelles and things like that that people love to eat and that have some medicinal properties um they have to be wild collected right we can't we can't cultivate those others we can cultivate and if they're done there seems to be no big difference in the um chemistry of those the medicinal quality of those so whether it's the rishi the lingchi a mushroom seems to be not a big difference between the wild collected and those that are uh, commercially produced or produced in your in your in your house, um, you know, it's all based on what the the medium that you're growing it on. If you have the right medium 
the, the right the right nutrients are in the medium you're using, they will show up in the mushroom. Okay, got it. All right, so um, Mike, um, and um, then we can move to Dr. Mueller. What can you tell us about the role of um, mycelium and mushrooms, the fungi kingdom, with respect to climate change that wasn't addressed in the movie? Um, wow. Uh, so that's, um, hmm. I, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a strong, um, you know, response that, that can, can, uh, measure up there. Um, you know, I, I would just, you know, just highlight that, um, mushrooms tremendously important, tremendously valuable. And, and that, you know, we, uh, I like the reverence, you know, at the end of, at the, at, at the close of that film, you know, the reverence that we have for the mushroom kingdom and, you know, the reverence that we have for the role that it plays. Um, it, it mirrors, you know, something that, that I've seen in the, the film that was out soil, right. You know, so just thinking also about, um, the earth and the planet. And so just really, you know, if, if I could root there, right, I would root there, you know, and just thinking about the relationship between mycelium and soil and our role in making sure that we advocate for policies that will protect both of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of my favorite um, movies from one of the past um, film festivals. So, yes, the regeneration of the soil, very powerful. And Dr. Mueller, anything that you can add for us about um, climate change and the mycelium? Sure. It was touched on a little bit in the film of the whole um, you know, carbon sequestration, so capturing the soil and and long-term storage in the soil, right? So the more carbon we can get out of the atmosphere and the more CO2 we can get out of the atmosphere and store it into the soil, that helps you know, mitigate against temperature increases and whatever else. And so fungi are a key part of the whole idea of natural solutions to climate change. So there's good data to show that uh, using natural solutions, so planting trees, uh, prairies, regenerative uh, agriculture can maybe take out almost a third of the carbon out of the atmosphere and re- really reduce and really mitigate against this growing problem of, um, of, the, of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which is causing climate change. And so fungi are critical in that role. There are also, as Mike was talking about in the soil movie and whatever else is that, we know that um, kind of traditional, what do you want to call it, agroecology um, takes and uses fertilizers and other um, compounds for um, the agricultural practices where more sustainable agriculture will allow fungi and other microbes to do a lot of that work and therefore reducing all the impacts of um, nutrient runoffs and the use of these chemical fertilizers and everything else. So fungi can play a super important role in uh, sustainable regenerative agriculture as well. So uh, I think fungi are, you know, one of the key components of um, natural solutions for combating uh, climate change. Okay. And um, in the movie, there was a lot of discussion about biopesticides. I would imagine that that would not be something that the commercial industry would be excited about. Uh, Where are we at in terms of the commercialization of the biopesticides? So I can speak a little bit about one of the the big products that um, Paul is marketing, which is really an exciting product, is his be safe uh, line of products, which is um, a, a mycelium that you can treat beehives. So one of the big causes of uh, colony collapse are these um, mites and viruses that are associated with the, with, the, with the virus, with the mites, the viruses associated with the mites. And uh, fungi can um, reduce the impact of these viruses and it seems to have a major impact positive impact on preventing um 
the collapse of colonies or the, the degradation of, of these bee colonies. The trick is, I was asking a uh, commercial beekeeper, is that he would love to use it, but so far the um, distribution mechanism, right now you have to sit there and treat every beehive, and if you've got hundreds and hundreds of beehives, it's more work than they can do. So while the commercial bee growers would love to use the product, the application hasn't been, you know, figured out yet how to make it viable on a large scale. So I think that's nice. one of the issues that we're having with these biopesticides is the application. So the product works. People want to use it, but it has to be commercially viable. So I think that that's part of the issue. To your other point is, does Bayer and some of these other big um, uh, insecticide companies are looking forward to it? I don't know. I figure if they could figure out how to commercialize it, they'll get on the bandwagon as well, right? If, but uh, right now it's more an, a uh, distribution problem. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up there, but I have one final question that I would like to put to both of you, which has to do with what kinds of actions we can take based on the things we learned tonight, the things you shared with us, some of the things that maybe you haven't shared with us yet. So what actions can people take in order to be a part of the solution? So, um, Mike, would you like to start? Uh, absolutely. Yes. You know, um, when I was uh, reflecting on this question, I just I wanted to folks to know, connect to an organization. Um, so, you know, in, in the sort of the, the slide deck, you know, there's the Illinois Steward Stewardship Alliance. You know, there's um, the, Col you know, the Colonet Collaborative, certainly if you are in the Chicago area. But um, wherever you are, um, connect to an organization. And, you know, I would uh, reference the Post Carbon Institute Six Foundations of Community Resilience, um, which, you know, the sort of the first um, uh, found founding principle in that um, list was people, right? Um, it's, it's, it's important, you know, to take an individual action that, you know, you can take, you know, to compost or to, you know, maybe invest in a different car. But, you know, the, the collective actions that you take with other people, the, the conversations that you have in community. Um, I live two miles uh, from the, the Calumet River and the, and the lakefront here. And, you know, we have this battle going on over general iron. And it's not just about general iron, but it's really about a larger community conversation about what type of investments we want to see in our community and what is the quality of life that we want to experience. So join an organization, connect to other people, and have those conversations that will uh, ground you in the environment of your space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Dr. Mueller, any additions? Well, yeah, I, Mike, I totally agree with everything you just said. That That's great. And I think partially it's also um, be basically informed citizens, right? So um, know what's going on. Um, both in the community-wide, but also, you know, um, know, you know, the biodiversity. So understand the importance of biodiversity. And then, you know, because uh, land use and these kind of decisions are so important, um, voting and supporting, uh, you know, uh, referendums for key environmental issues, social issues, you know, Changing your light bulbs and composting is great. But what you can have a really big, big impact is by, you know, supporting the right referendums, supporting the right candidates, uh, that type of thing, because that has a big impact on, on what we're doing. So uh, referendums for um, your local forest preserves and whatever else to maintain those and enhance those. Or referendums for, uh, I was just reading there's, you know, still ongoing conversation in some places about being able to grow food and have gardening in your in your yard. And uh, there's uh, um, some towns have issues about having native plants in your yard because they're messy. You know, so um, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, things that you can do at the at the ballot box as well as uh, joining communities, as as Mike was talking about. Be engaged, I guess. Is the, I think that's probably the biggest thing you do is be engaged. It's 
a great way to summarize it, to be engaged. And I do think that we've captured some of these action items and we're going to be sharing them with um, a transcript of the chat. So stay tuned for that. And um, I'd like for our participants to begin thinking about um, the actions that you will all begin to take. So keep that in mind as we begin to close out here. And um, on behalf of myself and the panelists, as well as the One Earth Film Festival, we hope that you have gotten a sense of our 10th year theme, which is inspiring change, and that you have seen that tonight, as well as throughout your participation in the other films that have been shown throughout our festival. And I want to invite you to go ahead and write your action items, the, the things that you will do to change in the chat, and we will read out some of those as we bring tonight's event to a close. In the meantime, I think you are aware, oh wait, let me just take a look at some, I'm just going to read a few of these uh, that have already been um, collected. So under um, Live Lightly on the Earth, what about refuse, um, reduce, repair, repurpose, and recycle, buy green, uh, rebuild the healthy soil from composting, reduced food waste, and eating plant-rich diets. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, is there another one? Yeah, use your voice. So I think this is what um, both Mike and Dr. Mueller were saying. Be engaged both locally and through your power of the vote and um, supporting our local forest preserves and our parks. And um, we, let's see, we'll have another one of these. Yes, um, some of this is a little hidden. Let's see, step into the mush room to watch more about uh, the fantastic fungi, um, commit to an organization, and there are a couple that are listed here. And again, you will see some of these collected and they will be available to you. All right, so um, again, we wanna have you put some of your personal actions in the chat. And one last thing that we want to do is um, we do have a raffle that both uh, Dr. Mueller and um, Mike are going to assist us with a raffle for a 24-hour uh, test drive of a Tesla vehicle. We've got two of those. And so I'm going to ask Joanna to uh, come online and help assist us with the raffle. And what we're going to do is I'm going to have um, both Mike and Dr. Mueller. Hi, Joanna. Welcome. Going to have uh, Mike and Dr. Mueller pick a number from 1 to 700, I believe. Is that right, Joanna? 1 to 700? Yes. Okay. So we'll have, we'll start with um, Mike. Mike, could you please pick a number from 1 to 700? And then Joanna will look and see who that person is that's going to win that 24-hour test drive. Okay. 489. 489. Okay. That would be... Just a moment. It's a long list. <laughs> that would be Melissa Petino. Oh, congratulations, Melissa. We will be in touch with you to work out the details. Melissa, congratulations. And um, you'll have to give us some feedback about that test drive. And now we are also going to have Dr. Mueller also pick a number between 1 and 700. And we will know who our other winner is. Uh, let's try 256. 256. 256. Drum roll, please. <laughs> exactly. That would be Barry Hartman. 
Barry Hartman, congratulations. Um, so you are our other winner of the Tesla 24-hour test drive. Congratulations. And again, don't forget to give the rest of us some feedback about what that test drive was like. And so um, I do want to um, just go back to the chat to find out a little bit about what some of your actions are. And I want to uh, read some of those. Tanya is saying that she's going to start a worm farm. Oh, my gosh. Blessings to you. I don't think I have it in me, but starting a worm farm. That's wonderful. Mike is saying, I'm definitely going to be recommending this film. Great. It was inspiring, super educational and could help a lot of people. Brianna is saying she's going to engage with policymakers. Debbie um, is going to find local green drinks to attend, uh, let's see, find local green drinks to attend their monthly, okay, I'm going to, I'm not sure I understand that one. Kathleen is saying continue to teach uh, care for the earth and all its beings. Cindy is saying she's going to start a regenerative victory garden. That's wonderful. Uh, Kristen and Kent, they're going to approach interactions with other people, living creatures, and nature as a treasured network of care and support. I love that. Thank you, Kristen and Kent. And I would encourage all of you, all of us, to think about what we will do in order to um, not just come and attend and listen, but to really take some action that will help and um, spread the message of this film. And from here, what I'd like to do is, if you're like me, you're probably really wanting to stay in touch with our panelists tonight. So... Um, we have uh, a slide that will give you a way of staying in touch with uh, both Dr. Mueller and with Mike. And we want to say a huge thank you to both of them for, number one, joining us tonight, and then also for sharing their expertise. So we appreciate your generosity, and uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And with that, I think... I think we are, let, oh, let's see. Um, I think we're doing a wrap. Would that be correct? Hold on. Oh, I've got some final announcements. So um, just a couple things as we, as we wrap up. So if you have found value in the film and in the festival, we would like to ask you to please donate to the Warner Film Festival. You can donate in a number of ways, financially, with your time, but please consider helping to support us. Also, we want you to be aware that there is an Earth Week mini film fest that's going to be um, launching uh, on April 9th, 19th through the 25th, April 19th through the 25th, and we, we will be doing that in partnership with the City of Chicago. So check out the One Earth website for additional information regarding that. A huge thank you to all of the participants that attended tonight, attended the festival, and then stayed for our discussion. And then as we say good night, we want to leave you with some parting words from Amanda Gorman, who you may recall is our national youth poet. Uh, poet laureate and activist, and she's going to be reading from her poem, Earth Wise, Earth Rise. Um, so as we listen to her, thank you again for joining us and um, stay tuned. Christmas Eve, 1968, astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. 
Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earth rise. A blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was our world's first glance at itself, a first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance, and a commonality, a glimpse into a planet's mirror. And as threats drew nearer, our own urgency became clearer as we realized that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who when the disaster is declared done still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this you're certainly aware, it's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little to marvel, to master the verve and the nerve, to see how we can serve our planets. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours. To use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating. We heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now, 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 because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal should be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots we will fail you not just as we chose to go to the moon we know it's never too soon to choose hope we choose to do more than cope with climate change we choose to end it we refuse to lose we do this and more not because it's very easy or nice but because it is necessary because with every dawn we carry the weight of the fates of this celestial body orbiting a star and as heavy as the weight sounded it doesn't hold us down but it keeps us grounded steady ready because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise to see it close your eyes visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls all of us change makers or in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew we relish the view we witness it's round green and brilliant blue which inspires us to ask deeply wholly what can we do Open your eyes, know the future of this wise planet is right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth uprising, all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for.